Hey friends, welcome to Kairos. Would you stand up? Let's worship together tonight.
Kairos, we're so glad that you're here tonight. We're excited to spend uh, the next hour or so worshiping with you and uh, listening to the teaching tonight. We're in a new series uh, called uh, Love and Lies, uh, Myths About Singleness and Dating, and so, uh, or Singleness and Marriage. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from Chris tonight. Um, but before we do that, uh, we've, we've started something here over the last several weeks, something called Passing the Peace. And uh, we'd like to continue doing that. Some of you have called it like a holy meet and greet. And uh, I, think, I think that's one way to put it. Um, but I, I think it, it can go deeper than that. You know, one of the reasons that we do this, um, this is something actually from the ancient church uh, that we're borrowing. Several hundreds of years uh, people have been doing this. And I think it's important that we do it for a couple of reasons. One, when we pass the peace, we acknowledge the reason why we're here to worship the Prince of Peace. Number two, it reminds us that we are people of peace and that we are peacemakers, not necessarily peacekeepers, but peacemakers. And that it also helps us look forward to the day when we will experience the ultimate peace, shalom, the peace that when Jesus comes finally for his church and we experience peace at its deepest level. So we wanna try to get a crack of the door glimpse of that now, and we're gonna do that by passing the peace. So if, you, if you've been here, you know how this works. I will say uh, something like, peace be with you, and you will say, that's great. So you guys, you can turn to people around you. We'll spend a few minutes doing that. Peace be with you.
Sing through every through every battle. Sing this out. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, that you are my portion, that you are my hiding place. We hear you sing.
about a new horizon. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new. Yeah. All my fears and doubts, well, they can all come to you. say the first part of this liturgy if you would say the second. Glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, amen. You guys can have a seat. Good evening, Kairos. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us tonight. My name is Jacoby, and I would love to continue our worship tonight by the reading of God's word as we do each week. As Boggs mentioned, we are kicking off a new series this week called Love and Lies. And we simply want to stand under God's word and ask his truth and his gospel to dispel and disarm the lies around singleness and marriage. And we believe if we stand confidently on his word, then we will be led down the right path. And so we are going to start our journey tonight in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And so before we dive into God's word and read it together, would you go to the Lord in prayer with me? Holy Spirit, would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear? Jesus, would you go before us in this text and make a way? And together we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Our text tonight is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 32 through 35. Paul says this, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married or who has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I'm saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. I'll say this is the word of the Lord, if you'll say thanks be to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Jack. I'll say bless the Lord, if you'll say, oh, my soul, bless the Lord. Bless his holy name. Hi, Kairos. 
The air's back on this week. That's nice. Bless the Lord. If you were here last week, it got steamy and not in the good ways. Well, we're off to a great start. Thank you kindly. Um, I'm Chris. I'm the pastor here. Uh, we want to engage the whole person with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ anywhere, anytime, with anybody. We want to be a place that creates and navigates and nourishes and flourishes our relationship with God and with others. I don't know about you, but I want to be the kind of people that we're divine dance partners. And when we hear the tune and the melody of the gospel, we begin to twist and turn in this divine dance where we are immediately responsive in obedience to God and the Holy Spirit for whatever adventure he is calling us in and whatever purposes he has in mind. A group of people who submit themselves underneath the authority of God's word, his ways, and his wills and say, here am I, Lord. Send me. And we want to do that not only in a relationship with our God, but we also want it to find obedience and expression in a relationship with others. That's difficult, though, sometimes. There are some people in your life, don't point to them, um, that are just difficult to love. Um, and sometimes those people are me and you. You're going to get in a season where you don't even want to be around yourself. And the people who are around you are struggling sometimes. And so I think we need to make sure that we do a deep dive into God's word and figure out where it is that we stand when it comes to relationships and especially with each other. As your pastor and as a person, you, I want you to know I want every single person in this room to be fully alive and fully free to be the person God intended you to be regardless of your current relationship status. Now, I have to confess to you, it's been 15 or odd so years that I've been around college and young adults, and I've grown weary of doing relationship series. I don't know how much more I can talk about it. Um, and there's limited amounts of scripture that you can jump off of sometimes that talk about singleness. Dating was a category that did not exist during the biblical times, okay? But there is an immense amount of biblical principles and information surrounding around the kind of person God intends you to be. And the good news about being single is that is the time you are supposed to be focused on that with intentionality and undivided devotion to the Lord. But here's the reason why this time I'm fired up and this series may last two months. I haven't been more excited about doing a relationship series in a long time. That's for two reasons. One, we did a recent survey in here and 80% of you in here are single. 80% of you. Hi, I see you. Hello. Another stat um, based off of national surveys, 90% of young adults who are currently single would like to get married one day. And so we need to talk about marriage and singleness. And the big statement I want to center around tonight comes from a guy named Ben Stewart. And he says this, God has ordained a season of singleness for every human being on the planet. So we need to talk about it. We need to hear what God says about it and what he says about who we are and who we are becoming. Now, quick time out, okay? For all my married people in the room, there's only 20% of you, but I'm one of you, all right? Let's have a chat real quick. I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer or be discouraging, but I don't need you to check out at this moment and be like, yeah, Chris, tell those singles all the things they needed to hear that I never listened to when I was single, okay? Your mother and I, okay, none of that, okay? <laughs> also, here, here, we need to broaden our understanding and comprehension of the season of singleness and how it is directly affecting the life and vitality of the church. If divorce rates continue to rise and mortality rates continue to decline, more and more people will be experiencing more prolonged seasons of singleness in their life, even if they didn't anticipate it. Take my mom, for instance. My dad died suddenly at the age of 27. She was married when she's 21. She has now lived more than half of her life as a single person. Wasn't expecting that, was she? I'm 45 years old, got married. I've still spent half of my life as a single person. More of my life has been spent single than it has been married. 
It is a crucial, critical time for us to secure an undivided devotion to the Lord, which is exactly the text that Jacoby just read. It's not to put restrictions. It's to promote freedom. It was to validate a season that a lot of people during biblical times didn't see as productive or all or just a season of waiting. Don't care. Don't really worry. Life doesn't start until you're actually married. Wrong. Wrong. Biblically. God has ordained a season of singleness for every human being on the planet. Second is 2 Corinthians 12, 12 says that we're members of one body with many parts, of which single and married people are together. So married people in this room, we have a responsibility, a discipleship duty to be invested in the life and vitality of those who are in a season of singleness. Single people, you have a responsibility for us too. We need help. Marriage is tough. We can't do it by ourselves. We need all the friends, intervention, babysitting, help out, like more please. Two of my spiritual daughters are here tonight and they've been helping us with our family for the past 15 years and sometimes I don't know how we survive without them. They have a vested interest in the health of my relationship with my wife, even though one of them's single. This is what the family got. This, we're not, here's what we're doing. Hey, married people, you're there. Single people, you're there. No, it's the family of God right here, front and center, ready to give an account for who we are in Christ Jesus. That's what we're after. So can we do a relationship series? We cool with that? Good. All right. Here's uh, two books that I need you to know I'm pulling heavily from. One is Seven Myths of Singleness by Sam Alberry. I recommend it. For those of you who don't read, just listen to the next several talks, okay? Then also Ben Stewart. I keep pulling from him. I wish I could find another source, but he's just good. And I don't want to like him, but I love him. Um, this is a Single Dating Engaged and Married Great Handbook. If you're looking to dig deep, he lays it out clear and through God's word. Incredible. I'm going to borrow generously and liberally from them. So... My whole saying is if there's anything profound, it's probably in one of these two books. If there's any silly, trite, or confusing, that's all mine and it's copyrighted, okay? <laughs> We're going into a series on relationship, love and lives, myths about marriage and singleness. I want you to remember something. You have an advocate. His name is Jesus. And he wants to see you flourish in this season of life. He wants to show you intimacy, connection, power, and authority. If that is true, the converse is also true. You have an adversary. His name is Satan, and he wants you to increase your brokenness, your sin, your blame, and all of the things he wants to do solidify into your soul so no matter what relationship you get into it, you have toxicity and dysfunction that sabotages it before it even starts. As another author puts it, relationships don't have problems. People have problems, and they bring them into relationships. And then those problems get problems, and those issues get issues, and then the black mold of dysfunction begins to grow in your soul, and you blame it on the other person. So the question is, do we want to deal with it now so that we can be kind to come people, become the kind of people who can articulate sentences out loud <laughs> that God's intended us to become? And my goal for tonight is to preach scripture clearly for us to respond in obedience, for you to have a clear grasp of what the biblical requirements of being single actually are. I'm going to offend some of you with scripture tonight, and that is not my intention. But we need to make sure that we're seeing clearly in the Bible what it is that Jesus says, who was single about what the seasons of our life need to look like. So we're going to walk through this next series. We're going to go through some myths, right? Like singleness is too hard or singleness is too easy. Us married people, we put that myth out there. Um, singleness means no intimacy. Singleness wastes your sexuality. Singleness means no family. And by the way, all of those myths have corresponding myths in marriage that we believe as well. Like somehow marriage means guaranteed intimacy. As soon as you say, I do, you're open, vulnerable, and honest with your spouse. And they see and love and value you for every secret part of who you are. Singleness wastes your sexuality. Marriage fulfills every single one of your sexual desires that you've ever had. Did it just get awkward in here? <laughs> we need to have real talk later. We can. We'll get there. Singleness means no family. Marriage means family you actually like and want to be around. That 
So I'm just saying, there's, there's myths and lies on both sections, all right? So we're, we're going to look at that through Scripture. And then also, I want to take maybe a night to process through Ephesians chapter 5 with my wife, Audrey, and take a look at the submissive wife and the sacrificing husband and how we have used and misused and abused that Scripture. And we need to wrestle through it. Just because it's been misapplied doesn't mean it's not true. So we're going to wrestle through God's word with that. And then I'm going to want to talk openly and honestly to my brothers and sisters who are in the middle of same-sex attraction. Because the church has done a horrendous job, a horrendous job of what we need to repent of, of trying to communicate to you God's holy standards and the compassion of of Jesus at the same time. And so that is going to be delicate, but it is also going to be direct. And I'll give you guys warning signals as those talks come up for which ones you want to be at. But one of the things we say about Kairos, it is our honest and unique attempt to connect to God and each other. And we need to be honest and start a dialogue with God's word, even if there's some things that we find offensive or disagree with or have questions about. I am a man who is under the authority of the Holy Scriptures, and I firmly believe this, whether I see it, feel it, or agree with it, everything you need for life and salvation is contained in these pages. And that does not exclude us from suffering and sacrifice. It didn't for Jesus. It does not for us. Good. We clear about where we're going? First myth, singleness is too hard. How many of you right now, you're like, Chris, here's what I don't need. Another talk from a married man about singleness. We get used to disappointment. It's life, okay? <laughs> Just kidding. We're going to have some, definitely have some female voices speak into it. Audrey's going to speak into it. Jacoby, as a single woman, is going to speak into it as well. We want as many perspectives on God's perspective as possible as we navigate this season. But it is. I understand. It's difficult. Don't forget, I spent half my life as a single person, okay? A couple of years I don't remember. That's because I was young, not because I was drunk, okay? And, uh, <laughs> it's, it's difficult navigating it. You guys are dealing with online dating apps, digital aid, text, call, don't do this, write back soon, sorry, so sloppy. It's just continuing to get really, really weird and wonky, and I'm about to step into it with some preteens, and I'm not looking forward to it, so please help me. But here's where singleness, I will give you, is way too hard. It's when it comes to conversations. Now, it's weird enough when you meet another single person in the same age demographic, and you find out you're single. It, can get weird or awkward or fun or flirty. It's up to you, potato, potato. <laughs> but here's when it gets just downright weird. When you're a single person and you're meeting a married person and you tell them they're sin you're single. Conversation killer. Oh. Right? They'll, they'll do one of two things. They'll look at you like your dog just died and they feel really, really bad for you. Or they'll grab you by the hand like you're their new friend like from the island of misfit toys and are like, we've got to fix them. We've got to fix them. They're single. They're single, right? We don't know what to do. Oh, you must be so miserable. You are incomplete as a person until you find another broken sinner to elevate your sin and brokenness, right? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. And church... We need to repent of the heresy that we have neglected the season of singleness that God has ordained for them to freely and fully discover who they are and their unique divine contribution. Married people, this is just for me and you. How about the next time we meet a single person, we start going, Woohoo! Oh my gosh, that's awesome! Tell me what you're doing right now. I want to know what you're doing with that freedom, that flexibility. Tell me what God's teaching you, how you're securing undivided devotion to God. Tell me what you're trying and failing at. I'm all ears. That might be a little bit weird, so you could just try and go tell me more about that. <laughs> if you're in a season of singleness, you're not a problem to be fixed. Scripture is elevating that season. For your dynamic, influential, kingdom impact. 
you can be free from certain concerns and complexities and complications and secure for yourself an undivided devotion to the Lord. Now, I'm going to do this again when we hit the myth that singleness wastes your sexuality, okay? But I'm going to say, the, I need to go over these verses just so we can put down a coat of biblical primer. I do not want to assume that everyone in this room has read God's word when it comes to the biblical sexual ethic. That's a fancy way for the God who invented human sexuality brought with some of it instructions. Okay? So just, there's some people, you're, you're in a season, you're acting in such a way that you go, I did not know that was in the Bible. Some of you know it's in the Bible and you're doing what you want anyway. So I'm going to remind you of what it says in the Bible, okay? Full disclosure, this comes with truckloads of compassion and also personal brokenness. So I know what it's like to hear the high standard of God's standard and fall at the feet of Jesus asking him for mercy and grace to live a different way. Okay? Cool. Here we go. First of all, biblical sexual ethic. Number one, marriage is between a man and a woman for life. That's Matthew 19, 4 through 5. These are the words of Jesus. Okay? We're going to hit these in a detailed, nuanced conversation later, but let me put this code of primer down. Number two, the only godly alternative, that is to marriage between a man and a woman for life, is celibacy. Matthew 19, 10 and 12. Number three, sex outside of marriage is sinful, Matthew 15, 19. Number four, sexual sin includes not just the act, but also our thoughts and attitudes as well, Matthew 5, 28. Jesus who has been, been painted sometimes as the tolerant version of God, instead of relaxing the Old Testament biblical sexual standard, he intensifies it. This is the Jesus who we say is the Son of God, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And is elevating what it looks like in the season of singleness, how to steward your sexuality. Now, I know, on our modern, western, overstimulated, oversexualized, overindulged ears and appetites, that grates on us. That creates on our individuality, our autonomy. This is my body. Actually, it's the Lord's. If you're underneath Jesus Christ's rule and reign, I know that is difficult, but here is what you need me to hear say. The answer is not ripping out the words of Jesus from your Bible so that you can construct a Christ who caters to your cravings. The answer is feel the rebellion that rises up in you like bile and put yourself at the feet of Jesus and say, I am tempted to live in the flesh and not be ruled by the spirit. Because Romans 8 says that those who are ruled by the flesh and limit the realm of the flesh cannot submit to God's law, nor do they desire to do so. But you, however, are not of the realm of the flesh, but the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of Christ is in you. And it's going to take the spirit of Christ in today's age, in today's culture, and your season of singleness to go, those are the very words of life. And no matter how difficult, countercultural, or lonely I feel, I will follow God so I can flourish. Jesus' standard for sexuality was so high that the Pharisees blushed and the disciples said, who, could, who can keep this teaching? But yet for some reason, the people who were caught in sexual sin 
found love and favor and mercy and forgiveness and a new way of living at the feet of Jesus. So much so that he locked eyes with a woman who was discredited, had the worst past you could ever imagine, and looked at her and said, where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. My heart for you is to go live a life that does not destroy itself and actively sabotage your future relationships because of the way that you're living now. There is a way that seems right unto man and woman, but there is a way that the Lord has. God has ordained a season of singleness for every human being on the planet. What that means is it is set apart. It's special. It's holy. It's distinct. It's to be used for a special purpose. You right now, if you're in a season of singleness, you are sitting in a moment of absolute freedom and flexibility, the likes of which you will never experience again, I can say for certainty, as a married man with children. I was hanging out one time. I just became a college pastor. I was meeting all the students. This guy named Whaley comes up. We're talking, and I'm like, oh, man, I'm back in college again. This is cool. Hanging out with dudes. It's awesome. My wife is over here. I've got two kids. She's got a bun in the oven. We're talking. It's about 730 at night. And all of a sudden, he's like, oh, man, Chris, what are you doing after this? I'm like, I don't know. Why? What's going on? He said, hey, we're going to go to the movies. Do you want to come? I was honestly silent for 30 seconds. That it, uh, He was like, are you okay? I said, I cannot compute what you just asked me. I understand the English meaning of the phrases that your lips just articulated. But it is nowhere in my template for the last 10 years of my life to make a last-minute decision to go to the movies. <laughs> there was a younger man who was ready to go, and he's like, do you remember that time? No. Make a split decision. I'm sure my wife would have left me, but it, my kids still have the same bedtime routine. They're still going to wake up in the same time in the middle of the night. I'm still going to wake up with my back killing me and a truckload of responsibilities that have not changed but doubled. Because when I go out, then my wife gets two more times to go out by herself with her friends. And I'm not as good at her job as, I, as she is. I'm like, you take that season of singleness and... Great story about that uh, kid, though. Uh, I, that's when I traveled a lot and spoke. And I'll go on the road, and it'd be difficult. It's tough to be away from my family. Um, even though I'm an introvert, I don't like to isolate myself a lot. He wound up coming on all the trips with me. Became one of my good friends and ministry partners. And I would, be, because I had extra hands, I was able to start bringing my kids along. I'm like, you deal with them. <laughs> But he was in a season where he had an incredible amount of flexibility and freedom to be able on a dime. I could call him like Friday when I'm leaving for a week. Hey, Whaley, can you come this week to camp with me? Yeah, man, I'm there. Hang on one second. I was like, okay, great. I'm not saying that's all of our roles, but there is a unique amount of undivided devotion that you can secure to the Lord for you during this time. It's a time, I want you here to say this, singles. You can be selfish and sacrificial. Selfish in the sense of, hey, let's go ahead and deal with you. Hey, that sin problem, your brokenness issue, your pride, your anxiety, all that stuff, it's not going away and stop putting the burden on your future spouse to make it miraculously disappear. There is nothing wrong, as Amber likes to say, longing for marriage in the season of singleness. Just don't put your ultimate hope in it. That's for Jesus. Because if you do, you're going to put a burden on them they can never fulfill. And you've already started to sabotage it before it even started. What do you want to work through? What do you want to protect your future spouse from, if that's even a possibility? What is God calling you right in this moment? Hey, this is distracting, this is distracting, and this is distracting from who I want you to become and the plans that I have for you. So let's zero in on this. I know it's going to cause you risk and vulnerability and perhaps even hurt, but sometimes it hurts before it helps. What is that? Because I think in singleness, it's much like salvation. 
it's not solely about the things that you abstain from. It's about the things that you are free to embrace. It's not just about what we're saved from. It's what we're saved for. It's not just about what we say no to. It's about what we have the ability to say yes to. It's not just about celibacy. It's about celebrating freedom and flexibility to secure an undivided devotion to God. It's not just about sitting around waiting for a spouse, waiting for the one. It's about becoming the one right here, right now, and investing in the lives of people around you. It's not about just sitting around waiting for heaven to come one day. It's about us actively engaging the mission of heaven here on earth. Single people, look at me. Love is looking for you, and his name is Jesus, and we are a part of his family. We see you, we value you, we love you, and we welcome you. What's keeping you right now from securing an undivided devotion to the Lord? Amen? So let's take 120 seconds and lean into that question. What is it you came here tonight to hear? What is the truth that scripture held up that you want to dismiss? But the Holy Spirit is driving it into your heart. This is simply called listening prayer. We try to let all the thoughts, all the songs... And all the content settle in and we ask God this. What's the one thing you wanted me to hear tonight? Once you got that, ask him by his grace and his goodness, what do you need to do in response? What's one action that you could implement in obedience that would begin to change the trajectory of this season of life? Let's listen together.
comfortable would you put your hands out in a posture of receiving I'll speak a prayer a blessing over us 
hey, don't leave tonight. If there's someone who's struggling with the righteous requirements that Jesus set out and there's sexual brokenness in your past, come let us pray over you. Someone needs salvation in this room tonight. You need to repent and believe. You're here tonight to hear this. There's a marriage in this room that's in trouble. And it's based off of decisions you made when you were single. It's not too late. There is hope. Let people come alongside of you. Swallow your pride. Don't keep that in secret and sin and shame and guilt and condemnation. There's someone in here tonight who's so lonely they can't bear it and has lost all hope that ever anyone would ever look at them and love them and value them. That is a lie. Don't believe it. He knows. He knows what you've done to medicate the pain and the hurt. He knows how rebellious you've been and you've run away and turned your back on who he is and what he's asking of you. And tonight, again, he calls his people to humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways so that he could heal their land, heal their lives, and heal their future marriages. All right, back to the blessing. Sorry. May you embrace God's sovereign season of singleness as the perfect time to secure an undivided devotion to the Lord. May you replace your false understanding of love with God's righteous standard of living. And may you do an about face, turn, repent, and believe only to receive the fact that love is looking for you. And his name is Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You guys have a quick seat. Amen. Guys, I'm coming into this series with a high expectation for what God is going to do over these next few weeks. And so, that being said, uh, if you're in the room tonight and you're single and you're struggling with it, or if you're married and you're struggling with it, and as Chris said, if there's brokenness in your past that you're dealing with, we would love nothing more than to pray with you. And so, each and every week, we will have uh, counselors up here at the front who are here to simply do that for you and pray over this family and this body of believers. And as always, too, if you want to fill out a prayer card and drop that off in the giving box on your way out, we pray uh, for those every Thursday and then throughout the week. And if you uh, want to know that you're being prayed for, just leave your number or your uh, email on that, and we'll just simply reach out to you and tell you that, that we're praying for you this week. Um, and as well, if you want to get any more information on, on serving here or um, getting in a group here, you can either go out to the info bar out there or just text uh, Kairos to 615-570-3506. I know we went back to the long number, but hopefully the jingle that we did a few weeks ago will help you remember that. We may bring it back. That being said, I would love if you guys would stand up. Let's close by singing the doxology together. and peace to love and serve the Lord. We love you guys. We'll see you next week.